I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We are a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week, here on Conservation Connection, we do just that. Introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with EarthX here in Dallas, Texas. EarthX is the largest Earth Day celebration in the world, and it brings in speakers from every corner of the environmental arena. Listen in to hear the stories of today's environmental titans, covering everything from environmental law, ocean health, renewable energy, clean transportation, and so much more. Let's get to the show. All righty, guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We are so incredibly excited to be back here in Dallas for EarthX 2022. If you've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that we get some really, really cool content from EarthX. Today, we are sitting down with Emily McGlone. She is the director of Peace Boat US. Welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're so glad to have you on the show. We're a big fan of what Peace Boat US does. So before we dive into kind of who you are as a person, if our listeners haven't heard of Peace Boat US, can you just give a little 90 second snippet of what your organization does? Sure. Well, we're an international organization. It was founded in Japan back in 1983, actually by university students in Asia who are really excited to promote a world with peace and sustainability. And we travel on board our ship, which is the Peace Boat visiting around 20 countries every three months, working towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, peace building, and education. That's awesome. So how did you get started with Peace Boat US? I joined Peace Boat actually because I was living in Japan, where our headquarters is located in Tokyo. I was an English teacher with the Japan Exchange and Teaching JET program, which is run by the Ministry of Education of Japan. And so I was already there for a couple of years, and I'd heard about Peace Boat. And then I did an environmental awareness bike ride called B, Bicycle for Everyone's Earth. And during that bike ride, I got introduced to Peace Boat's next global voyage, which was visiting Patagonia. And I was so excited to go back to Patagonia because I'd been there once before. And so I got in touch with Peace Boat. One of those ideas where you just email info at Peace Boat. And they wrote back to me looking for English and Spanish teachers. And that's how I joined. That's awesome. How old were you at that time, if you don't mind me asking? I had just graduated from university. I was in Japan a couple of years. I was probably around 21, 22. That's so cool. That's the perfect time to just kind of launch into the unknown and get out there and experience things, which is a big part of what Peace Boat US does, right? Is experiential learning to just kind of break people out of their mold, right? That's right. Yeah, we really believe in the model of learning through experiences and connecting with local communities. And as we travel to so many countries, we have guest speakers who come on board and give lectures and workshops. So you're actually learning about all these different issues around the world before you arrive in each port. And so you have this educational experience on board the ship, and then you learn firsthand by being in each of the countries that we visit. I love that. So before we get too much more into Peace Boat US and everything you do with them, what were you like as a child? Like, did you know you want to work with environmental issues or did you think you would go somewhere completely different? That's a really good question. I think I did a lot of things when I was younger around education and volunteerism. I started going abroad when I was 16. It was my first time doing a volunteer trip to Mexico. We were in the Yucatan Peninsula in Merida. And that really opened my eyes a lot to development projects worldwide and seeing different levels of extreme poverty that I'd never really been exposed to so much where I lived. Um, I grew up in California and North Carolina and Asheville. And then, you know, going abroad really allowed me to have a different exposure that I hadn't seen before. So that helped me to get more into volunteer work. And I think I carried that with me all the way through high school and university and got involved in, I'd say, almost hundreds of volunteer projects uh, while I was younger. Yeah, that's amazing. And I I definitely agree with you that kind of the first time you get out of your own bubble and you sort of experience something that is completely outside of what you even conceive the world to be like, not only is it completely change your worldview, but it also is kind of addictive. It makes you want to keep seeing more and more and experiencing more. And I think that 
we've kind of entered, I mean, we've been globalizing for centuries now, right? The world becomes smaller and smaller each year. And I think that we're kind of at this tipping point right now where we have the ability to call somebody across the world and talk to them immediately. And as that becomes easier and easier to do, it becomes more and more important to intentionally expose yourselves to things outside of what your kind of day-to-day experience is. Absolutely. And I think it is so important as the world does become more global, as you say, and you know, connection is even more immediate. It's important to understand where people are coming from as well. And I, I really find that, like you also said, it becomes almost addictive to learn more, to explore more, to meet more people and find out local reality has became something I was really interested in on Peace Boat. My first voyage, I was actually a Spanish teacher as a volunteer. And so I was teaching Spanish every day and we were visiting so many countries. And that first voyage, I just really was excited to travel on Peace Boat. I wanted to do it again. So ended up becoming a staff member right after that. Yeah. And so now you just get to do it all the time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I've been around the world six times on the Peace Boat and each voyage is three months long. So I've spent a lot of time at sea and a lot of time in many different countries that I would never have had the opportunity to visit if it hadn't been for you know this incredible organization who allowed us to um, teach on board, volunteer, and then learn in all the countries that we visit. Right. I love that you can just casually be like, oh, yeah, I've been around the world, uh, I don't know, six times, something like that. <laughs> That's so cool. And I'm I'm low-key jealous. <laughs> you should see some of our other uh, colleagues who've been around the world 14 times oh or 15 gosh. times. Yeah. But those who have a long uh, you know, experience with Peace Boat, it's every three months we have a global voyage. So you get lots of opportunities to travel. That's really cool. So I want to kind of dive in a little bit more into Peace Boat's model. For the everyday consumer that's not, you know, staff or whatever, if I wanted to be involved with Peace Boat, what does that look like? Yeah, there's lots of ways you can get involved with the Peace Boat in general. You can, one, volunteer like I did. So you can be an English or a Spanish teacher. We also have a web reporter position for those who like to write articles and write about things that are happening or take photos or do videography on board. Um, and those are the volunteer positions. There's also the interpreter positions uh, for those who want to translate between, it could be English and Spanish, Japanese, or Korean, Chinese. We have a lot of participants from Asia because we are founded in Japan. And then if you just want to come on board and travel, you're also welcome to do that. And so most people pay uh, for the full three months around the world because, of course, with Peace Boat, you want to go all the way around the world. You don't want to go like halfway around the world. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's more exciting to do the full voyage. And you can come on for segments if you wanted to go just in Asia or just in the African region or Europe. But most, like 99% of the people come for the full voyage. And it works out to be pretty fairly um, economical. I say, I'd say 180 to $200 a day, for example, if uh, you have a shared cabin with friends. Um, and we also have family cabins. We have single cabins with balconies. So depending on what style of travel you like, you know, obviously it can be set up the way you like it. And we also have younger participants even starting at ages two to seven years old wow. from the Montessori education program that we have on board. So people can come with their kids if they want. And yeah, it's just a really welcoming environment. Anybody's welcome from all walks of life. What an incredible foundation. Like, can you even imagine being three or four years old and spending three months on a boat circumnavigating the globe and just getting to experience local realities that are just from such an early age? That'd be such a cool experience to have. Those kids really change quite a lot. I've, I've definitely seen the Montessori education program be a highlight of the voyage because the children who participate in it, they're, you know, all ages kind of mixed together, the Montessori style, where they learn from each other, leadership skills and environmental education mixed with hands-on learning, you know, and I, I heard some of the younger kids say sometimes to their, their parents, oh, tomorrow we're going to hike up the pyramids in Egypt. And you're just thinking, wow, <laughs> this kid is amazing. You know, just learning about the countries and the cultures and, and geography. It's just really interesting to see how much they learn. Definitely. So what does like the average day, the average week, the average month look like if you're doing that entire voyage as a customer? Yeah, well, it's pretty exciting. So we call everybody who comes on board our participants because they're really participating in the global voyage. So we have lots of ways that people can organize their own events on board. And then we have uh, the Peace Boat main core team, which organizes the you know guest speaker events and highlight events, or bigger festivals on board, or Earth Day when it's April, we organize these large events on the ship. But a typical day on Peace Boat, I'd say uh, we organize more than 60 events every day. So when you are planning for the day that comes, at the nighttime, you receive a newspaper on board, and you can see in that newspaper from 6 a.m., morning coffee or sunrise yoga on the ship or something early morning. You know, then you have your full day program of events. 
Usually we have guest speaker lectures starting around 10 a.m. on the ship. And then we have different guest speakers talking about various global issues. So we also change the topics as we travel from country to country. And we have different guest speakers flying in. So, for example, if we're traveling from, let's say, Greece to Spain, we'll have the guest speaker from Spain fly to Greece and join us from there. So as we're traveling towards Spain, you're learning about the culture and the history. And so gaining that knowledge before you're there. Um, so those activities change every section of the voyage. But most days, people are up and active all day long. You never really get bored on the Peace Boat. There's just so much you can do. And for example, if you want to do a podcast on board, you could have your podcast activity every day from 2 p.m. Come record a podcast. You know, it could be like sessions and workshops. We have music, also dance, culture, photography classes, salsa, you name it. It sounds a little bit like you're just spending every day becoming a more connected global citizen, just learning from all of these different cultures that are outside of your norm. That's exactly what it is. We really support becoming a global citizen. So what are the ways that your participants interact with the local communities that you visit when you're not at sea? Yeah, we have so many different programs. We call them exposure programs or, you know, experiential or exchange programs. So in each port, depending again on, you know, where we're visiting, um, we will work with local NGOs and community groups or women's groups youth groups as well, um, and sometimes government officials and delegates who, you know, want to support us from our partnership with the United Nations. So we have different programs in each country, usually four to five different study programs people can choose from. For example, I used to work a lot in South America. Um, so in Chile, we would arrive at the port of Valparaiso, and we would have uh, one program that might be going eco-hiking, we call it. So learning about sustainability and hiking in the beautiful national park. And that would be towards conservation efforts with our local environmental NGO partners. We would also learn about the dictatorship that happened in the 1970s and 80s in Chile and maybe meet with um, those who had been previously, um, you know, human rights experts or learning about um, what it's you know, like to be in that kind of situation where you're being detained or some kind of experience, a testimony from the local partners. And then we might also have a youth program. So people can see, you know, these are all different programs that are offered and people can sign up for which program that they would like to learn about, or they can have a free day and just go explore on their own. So Peace Boat is very open. Everything is optional. All the programs on board are optional, all the programs in the ports as well. So people just really look at the opportunities that we provide as staff members of Peace Boat. We often go to the countries about six months to three months before, work with our local NGO partners, and then build the programs and offer them to our participants, and they can sign up for anything that interests them. Wow. That sounds like just the greatest way to learn everything, pretty much. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier y'all have volunteers, but you also told us before the interview that y'all have an internship. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, we have an internship program with Peace Boat. So as I mentioned, our headquarters is based in Tokyo. So for those who are interested in being in Asia or are already based there, you can also volunteer with that office. Um, our office in the United States is in the United Nations Plaza, and that's where I'm the director. So we have an in-person and a hybrid online internship program. So typically Tuesdays and Thursdays, our interns are online from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I coordinate the internship program. So they get to work directly with me and participate in so many different United Nations related conferences and events. Peace Boat holds special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So we receive a pass to participate in all kinds of UN events, and therefore our interns also get their UN passes, and they get to participate in lots of programming, you know, write articles for our website, for example, do social media, outreach, video editing. We're always looking for videographers and editors if you're listening out there and you want to <laughs> join us. There's so much content that we have traveling around the world that we're always trying to create more stories. So. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. It's so much fun. It's, yeah. a, lot of, it's a lot of excitement. So um, yeah, our internship is open on a rolling basis so anybody can join and there's no age limit. Awesome. Oh, great. I might apply. Um, so if someone wanted to find the information about that internship, where would they go? You can go to our website. It's peaceboat-us.org. And then you click on the Get Involved section and you'll see the application. It's a super simple one-page application for the internship. And then just send us your resume along with that. And then we can set up an interview. So if you're listening and that's interesting to you, scroll down to the show notes. We're going to go ahead and drop that link in the notes. You guys can click on it from the podcast wherever you're listening right now. And you can go ahead and send that application in today. So another thing that I was kind of hoping that we would get to talk about in this episode is sort of this interplay between being a nonprofit that strives for education and globalism and some of the issues that come with 
cruise ships, right? Big maritime vessels, the negative environmental impacts they can have. So what is Peace Boat US doing to address this interplay between those issues? Yeah, that's such a great question and a really important one that's been at the forefront of Peace Boat's work for the past few years. We are in alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we focus a lot on SDG number 13 for climate action and SDG number 14 for life below water, as well as education and partnerships and so many of the goals. Um, And with that, we really decided we needed a cruise ship that will be in alignment also with our, you know, morals and goals as an organization. So we've been working towards building uh, Peace Boat's eco ship which will be a really transformative model for the maritime industry to decarbonize um, shipping and to help create a model which will use solar and wind power to reduce our CO2 by 40%. And then in the future, we're also working towards a zero carbon emission cruise vessel that will be a passenger vessel that can hold still, you know, over 1,500 or 2,000 people to be able to host these environmental programs. But we also want to have a marine research laboratory, a wet lab and a dry lab on board and have also a space for investigation and research. This is also uh, right now the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And so Peace Boat, as a partner with the United Nations, we really want to contribute to that through education. And we believe that EcoShip will give us the venue and the space to really have researchers and ocean experts come on board with youth and students who want to learn about maritime industry-related programs as well. So we're excited to see this coming to fruition. We're still looking for some partners who might want to join us and hoping that this will be a game changer for the maritime industry. Yeah, that makes me so excited to hear about. Can you tell me a little bit more about kind of the process of developing the eco ship and what are some of the features that are going to make it a game changer for the maritime industry? Yeah, sure. So when we started this idea of, you know, we want to build a more sustainable cruise ship. So we're a nonprofit organization 501c3 nonprofit in New York, also an NGO and nonprofit in Japan. But we have the social business side, which is also based out of Tokyo. And through our travel partners, we're able to kind of have that funding source coming in through those who travel on board the Peace Boat. And then we're able to use that for our nonprofit program. So we thought little by little, we can start putting some of those funds towards EcoShip. And then with partners and investors, we organize an EcoShip charrette. We brought together specialists in the field. Right now, we're supported by partners such as uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, National Geographic Explorer and Ocean Expert, uh, Fabian Cousteau, who's an aquanaut and explorer, is also on our board of you know supporters for EcoShip, along with Amory Levins, who is also very you know known for the Rocky Mountain Institute. And so all of those partners come with us um, to bring these ideas together. And without those partners, we wouldn't have the expertise that we need. But together as a global community, we're finding ways that we can develop new norms for the ship. So for example, we're going to have more than 10 retractable wind sails and solar panels, which will be on the roof to capture the solar energy and the wind as we're traveling. We'll have smart meters in the room so people in their cabins, they can check how much energy they're using per day and they can check if they've used you know, more energy one day. I don't know, I forgot to turn off the lights. Make sure they turn them off the next day and they can check their own energy use. That's cool. That's such an interesting way to build good habits, right? Because, I mean, I have an electric meter on my house, obviously, because I need to know what I'm paying for electricity. But I'm not checking it daily to see like how much electricity did I use today versus yesterday. And so what a what a fascinating fascinating way to connect people's behavior to the outcome of their behavior. Yeah, it's definitely an educational tool. And it's something that people, the more you engage with it, the more kind of fun it becomes. And also, you know, it's it's helping you to realize how much energy you use every day, right? And then we also are going to have a kinetic energy dance floor. So <laughs> we'll have in the club, people can dance and that will create energy that will then help to, you know, power the ship. And so all these different aspects, we hope to be more sustainable. We're already going plastic free on board. We're already reusing some of the gray waters and trying to create an electric system that's really hybrid and focused on renewable energy. Yeah. And that's just finding another way to like help make helping the environment and sustainability and all of that stuff more fun for people who, you know, want to do it, but maybe they're like, I don't, it seems like a lot of work. And like, y'all are just making it a fun time. Yes. And, you know, for us also, we really believe that Peace Boat is an enjoyable adventure on the ocean through educational programs and learning and experiences. You can really inspire people to change the world and make it a better place. So speaking of being on Peace Boat, being a fun as well as educational time, can you hit me with like one or two of your 
personal favorite experiences or memories that you have had on Peace Boat? I have so many. I I know that's a hard question. (laughs) Yeah, I have a lot. So I could start with, let's think about Jordan is one of my favorite places that I visited. We dock in the port of Aqaba and I also am a scuba diver. So I was excited to um, dive in the Red Sea. And so we arrived at Jordan early in the morning and this was an incredible day because I got to go diving uh, and I went by myself. I just booked a dive a couple of days before we docked, went diving in the morning. It was incredible. Saw so many beautiful sea life and, and the corals that were there. And then in the afternoon, I got to go see Petra, which is, you know, the famous kind of rock structure that's in Jordan. And it was just one of those days you're like, wow, this is incredible. And it's a very short day, but you can do so much when you plan a little bit on the piece, but you really can see places that you would never get access to otherwise. But then at the same time, um, being in the Middle East, another experience I had in Jordan also was visiting a Palestinian refugee camp. And that one also sticks out in my mind as something that really changed my life, being able to go do a homestay program and stay with the Palestinian refugees who had come, you know, and people think about refugee camps as tents and places where they're giving out water or food or, you know, support, possibly like what's happening right now in Ukraine and Romania, for example. But the Palestinian refugee camps we visit in Jordan, they've been there for, you know, so many years, decades, really. And and it's it's a community. It's, It's a house that you get to stay in with this family and you learn so much just through that. So... I think some experiences like that are really, we say traveling the peace boat way. It's learning, but it's learning in in a way that you would never have the experience if you were on peace boat. So coming back a little bit, I could talk about peace boat all day, but coming back a little bit to why we're here this week, we're here for EarthX. Um, So what made y'all want to be involved with EarthX? What are you here doing this week? Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, we're really excited to be at EarthX this year. We have various partners who are here and we're working together to, first of all, showcase uh, EcoShip as a transition model for the maritime industry and future ship of Peace Boat. So we have an exhibition that we'll be uh, sharing here. And then we also have a discussion for the SDGs Media Summit. We're going to be talking about the United Nations World Oceans Week, which is every year on June 8th. And so we have partners that are with us, our colleagues uh, from Blue Planet Alliance. We have the founder, Hank Rogers. We also have Roberto Cerda from Restore Coral and one of our youth for the SDG scholars from Mexico, Sylvia Cantu. And we'll be on a panel together talking about the World Oceans Week and partnerships towards this year's theme, which is revitalization and collective action for the ocean. Awesome. So do you all have anything specific planned for this year's World Ocean Week? We're definitely going to be doing a few events. Um, As I mentioned, our office is based in New York City, which is also the headquarters of the United Nations. So there will be an in-person and hybrid event on June 8th. Everybody can tune in and you can listen from home. It's unworldoceansday.org. And we'll be having a full day program that day with incredible speakers, inspirational uh, photography exhibition and contest. And then, of course, we'll have some music and art as well. Um, And then in-person events uh, throughout the week, we've been creating not just World Oceans Day on June 8th, but rather the full week or month of activities. So June every year will be a time when the ocean community can come together. And we invite you all to check out the website. They have a list of events basically listed on the website. And then we also have a group called the Friends of UN World Oceans Day. And so if you're interested in ocean-related activities, your organization can also sign up and join this group. That's awesome. So just to kind of wrap up a little bit here, for our listeners that are listening in their car, at home, wherever you are, cooking, whatever, um, if you had advice for them on how to get started in this field, or even if they don't necessarily want to work in this field, things that they could do on their own to help the world be a better place. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just to try and get involved with local volunteer activities wherever you are. I found that every time I volunteered for one group or one activity or said yes to any opportunity, you're always going to meet new people who are interested in the same things that you are because they're there as well, supporting or being part of that group. And it will always open a door for you. So I always tell people, just take that first step and get involved in something local in your community and you'll always meet great people there. And then second, I would say, educate yourself about some of the topics, you know, listen to podcasts more, tune into some interesting radio stations or YouTube channels and learn about some of the issues because the more you learn, the more exciting it becomes when you recognize that you already are finding out and learning more about the topic and you can kind of meet people in the space and that 
that's, I think, really important is just educating yourself a little bit and just taking that first step and, and saying yes to things. I think often people are kind of nervous and don't know if they can really do it or not or if it's for them. But by saying yes and just trying, I mean, the worst you could do is not enjoy it for a moment. And then you can change your route. If, if it wasn't something, an environment that was interesting to you, maybe you go towards humanitarian work or disaster relief or volunteering in a homeless shelter and supporting, you know, food security. There's so many ways that people can help each other. But I think the biggest thing is just try to do one small thing and get involved. In a nutshell, get out of your comfort zone. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here on the show today. This was an awesome episode and I cannot wait for people to hear more about Peace Boat US. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to collaborate more and just looking forward to having everybody who's listening come and join us on board. Check out our website. You'll see the entire Global Voyage listed there. So you can join us here or somewhere near you. Yay. Can't wait. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.